Hello again, Pats fans, and welcome back to the latest and always greatest edition of Six Rings and Football Things, a presentation of WEI Odyssey and 2400 Sports. It's midweek time, so that means it's mailbag time. You got your old pals Fitzy and Primetime himself, the band leader of the DVOA holes, everyone's favorite Pats fan. That's right, Chris Scheim. Scheim time is here with me. And Shima, before we get into the mailbag, uh, answering the questions, the queries, the inquiries of the Foxborough faithful and Patriots pals in and amongst us in this delicious little Six Rings community, I want to get a quick spin from you, get your take on how things panned out in the desert Monday. Obviously, Andy Hart and I were on till the wee hours of Tuesday morning, talking Pats, processing and analyzing the 27-13 victory a game that Andy said was over three plays in when Kyler Murray sadly blew out his knee trying to juke a Pats player on an unscheduled run, unscheduled injury, unscheduled game that I still, you know, I've gone back and looked and there are more things I like in this game than in many recent a Patriots contest. But I like, like defensively, it's like basically pass rush and Marcus Jones all day, all night. But there were a lot of injuries. Again, there was really questionable play calling. A third of the pass plays were behind the line of scrimmage. Um, it's one of those like you were gifted the win or and or in spite of yourself style dubs, if you ask me. But I would love to hear what you thought uh, once the game wrapped up Monday night. Yeah, I mean, the Patriots won the game and I think their defense played great. I, I can't I can't knock them at all. Yes, they got fortunate that Kyler Murray was ended up not play, basically not playing in the game and you were dealt. Colt McCoy. Um, uh, you know, I think you kind of got a little lucky with that, mm -hmm. but at the same time you made, you took advantage of that luck and you made sure you didn't let it go to waste. Um, and the defense really capitalized on that. I thought the offense was, uh, again, just it, what it has been not great. I, I think they had one really good drive. Um, and so I actually am, am very much, uh, of the belief that, this short game. I understand that people hate the amount of screens that are run, but these quick passes, these slants, mm -hmm. these screens, uh, jetting Marcus Jones on the, on the, on the motion. I, I think simple things like that are what's going to allow this offense success. Like it's plays like that, that open up the all seams routes, uh, that Matt Patricia calls at the end of the game that sets up Hunter Henry for a 39 yard reception, which so, is great, which was yeah. great. God, which, was that nice to see. That was one of Max best play it, it, outside of the Vikings game. That was Max. One of Max best plays of the year because he, he, he took the snap. It was three steps. He, he threw the ball. Not one of the things that I've been, I've had an issue with Mac this year is that he's staring down guys and he wants to see them be open instead of trusting that the route or the receiver themselves will get open. Good and, call. And, and that pass in general, I thought was uh, good to see because with that, it was the three-step drop ball was out with anticipation, ex expectation that, okay, my eyes have been holding the safety left. Hunter Henry will be open down the seam on the right. And sure enough, he was. That's what I want to see more of. And and I need, to, I need to see more of going forward. And I'll tell you what else that goes part and parcel with. Hand in hand with the, hey, shut up and just trust the route concept and or the play that we've called. Now, I know there are people that have been pushing back against Mac for – barking, shaking off Patricia, being more vocal, being unhappy with the offense, his own play. Uh, the F-bomb heard round the world Monday night was actually not at Matt Patricia, but rather it was a play clock issue, just to qualify yep. that one. That's two weeks in a row, by the way. Mac Jones has had to contribute to the big old swear jar at one Patriot place on national TV. One was streaming, the other ESPN, whatever. Someone's got a potty mouth, and we knew that about Mac Jones. I like the fire, though. I like the fire. I like the pushback. I like each of them trying to make the other give them the best of what they have to offer. But weirdly enough, this is the first time that not only I am in lockstep with you in that I love the sh I don't love the short game. I like the short game. Mm -hmm. I like what they were it's doing a necessity with necessity right now. It well, it's, it's it's what you have. It's the best thing you have. And it and works against a team that's going to blitz a ton. Exactly, which is what what the Cardinals defense is known Bingo. for because they're not good up the gut and they're the worst in the red zone. And look what the Patriots got, a bunch of red zone touchdowns on Monday night as well. When you're going to incorporate guys like Kendrick Bourne, whatever gets my guy Kendrick Bourne more involved, I'm all for. The speed of Tyquan Thornton, Nelson Aguilar, and now two running backs, the rookies who got invited to the party, and like you mentioned, Marcus Jones, but the rookie running backs out of necessity got invited to the party because Harris was inactive. 
Mondre got hurt a couple plays into the game with an ankle. Now he's questionable coming into this week's game. And Damian Harris, who knows if he'll be healthy enough. He made the trip, but who knows if he'll be healthy enough. You may be seeing Damian Harris's clone with the same last name. And Pierre Strong Jr., who I got to say, every time, Shime, there's a chance to see somebody with elite speed, like getting Marcus Jones going in space, I get excited because we just haven't seen that at all the last two years. Pierre Strong's got some jets. And when he took that uh, delayed draw left and went 41 yards, yards yeah, 41 yeah. yards, 44 yards, like it was like, oh, my God. Patriots, there's fast players on the Patriots. This is great. Maybe the quick game does work. And then when it sets up Hunter Henry, it's a beautiful thing. And and I think the utilization of Marcus Jones ties into that as well. It's like he was on, he was, he was the MVP of that game, in my opinion, just because he was playing offense. He laid an absolute boom shakalaka slam on Trey McBride in the middle of the field. Yeah, like on he a is, big old dude. Kick yeah. return, punt return didn't matter. Marcus Jones is on the field. And and I think the beauty of having him in those offensive sets is you don't need to funnel the ball to him. He's not that kind of player, but just like the Tyreek Hill effect in that you're putting him in motion, puts stress on the defense and forces them to adjust on the fly to a fast, capable ball carrier. And, and by doing that, you just immediately open things up on opposite sides of the field and you create space, which is what this Patriots offense needs. Um, it was good to see the, the rookie running backs play well. I was happy for them. I love, I, I loved Pierre Strong uh, in, mm-hmm. in the draft, actually. I thought he reminded me a lot of Darren McFadden in the way that he was kind of a one cut and go kind of running back uh yeah an, an, an upright track type. star upright track star looking guy yeah yeah he was he fits right into that zone kind of running game um that you know you've seen the kubiaks and, and the, the shanahan's of the past run um and, and so i was excited to see that and I, I i would disagree with you i don't i would normally like fire from my players but just mm-hmm. everything else that has come with the uh mac jones fire his comments yesterday where um, he's talking about Josh McDaniels and he's saying McDaniels coached me hard. And yet a couple, a week, week and a half ago, he was saying that he wants play pe- people here to coach me hard. I think a lot of those feel like petulant veiled shots at Matt Patricia, which mm. I don't think Matt Patricia has been good, but I also don't think that you need to feed into the, uh, chaos that, that it has been creating. And so, uh, I don't necessarily think that the the fire from Mac Jones was a good thing. Uh, I actually think that it was a bad thing. But ultimately, I think the offense in general looked pretty good. Yeah, I I, I want to see Mac Jones reel it in or exact. Don't be bratty. Don't push back. Don't try to show up your coordinators or your coaches. No veiled shots. Not no nothing immature or out of emotional control in that regard. I just want to see the fire on the field. I want to see. You know, Andy and I talked about in the post game show, we talked about how Mac Jones at the podium sounded completely different than Mac Jones on the field. Like when he did the interview with, I believe, Lisa Salters on the field after the game, you know, he sounded a little more aggressive. He sounded a little more, he, he sounded like a football player. Like he sounded like a dude. And then he gets up to the podium afterwards and like, you know, hey, everything's just going to, you know, like, well, you know, we can coach better. We can do better. We can do everything like I, I want to hear like this offense needs this Patriots team needs attitude. This Patriots team needs a little more oomph, some pop to be able to get things done because there's just not enough talent alone. Well, you got enough guys that are doubting the concepts and doubting the scheme and doubting the assignments. So you need someone to kind of get everyone fired up. And that's what your leader, that's what your quarterback, who is a team captain, is supposed to do. Yeah, I I guess, but that's not the kind of fire I want to see. I think to me that is a different kind of fire. Um, So I don't love that. I would rather them start believing in the Judon Uche fire, which to Mm. me was freaking awesome. I think I I have, like... If Defensive mea- player of the week in if, Josh Uche. If I have a mea culpa on the season, as of right now, it's, mm-hmm. man, I'm sorry I badmouthed Josh Uche. Like, the guy can play football. He's fast. He's he's a lot of fun. Like, right now, he's very much just a situational pass rusher, but that's what he's good at, and keep him at that. Don't don't force him to be anything else right now. Allow him to grow, uh, because if there was one thing I was wrong about heading into this season, it was it was Josh Uche, and I, I 100% take, uh, take full responsibility for that one.
There you go. And this has been Walk It Back, one of our new segments here on the Six Rings podcast. I was prepared a couple weeks ago, I told you offline, to walk back my prediction for comeback player of the year in Baker Mayfield. And then the guy leads the most insane comeback of all time last Thursday stupid. for the That was so stupid. That, so that, that was the worst. Like that was, and the Patriots, of course, are gearing up for the team that allowed that. Uh, the Raiders are just something, something special. I went to bed. I went to Holy bed with smokes. multiple bets on the Raiders and like having Raiders money line. Just money and line. I, that's all I needed. I went to bed 16 to three and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to wake up with money in my bank account tomorrow. And then I woke up to a 17, 16 final and I was in agony. Yeah. I, I got to tell honestly, between the Raiders and then the Dolphins not being able to reach 20 points on Sunday night. I took a bath last weekend. Yeah, that was took that an was absolute tough. bath last weekend. But the listeners are not here to find out how much money Shime and Fitzy lost on their respective bets. No, no, no. They're here for the Patriots analysis, the Foxborough talk, and more. And I do want to share one little fun tidbit with you because I know you love a tidbit. Oh, I do love a tidbit. Um, how about this? About Marcus Jones. I picked this up from uh, Pat Lane, uh, who got it via M. Boston. Marcus Jones is the second player in NFL history with a receiving touchdown, a punt or kick return touchdown, and an interception in the same season. And it's like the, some guy from like the 60s, right? No, you ready for this? The only other one to do that in the NFL in his rookies uh, in ever. the same season. Not even a rookie. Yeah, the only other ever. one to do it in the same season ever. 1992, that player, Deion Sanders. Really? That's kind Damn. of Damn. Cool. How about That's that? That's really cool. That's good company to be in. That's some pretty good company. Prime right. time. Anytime you time, time prime time. Anytime you can just say it's you and prime like that, it doesn't get much better than that. No, that, and uh, you know, working him in, you know, you may even see a couple more plays every week. He's not going to be a full-time receiver. He's not going to get as many snaps as Aguilar or Bourne or even Thornton, but the Marcus Jones package, if you will, is now a regular and necessary part of the Patriots offense. And you mix in him and speed like that with Pierre Strong, and maybe, just maybe it'll open things up a little bit more. This offense, I'm not going to say explosive just yet, but there can be some legitimate dynamics in play as well. I also don't want to overlook Kevin Harris because he is a, I would almost say a literal doppelganger of Damian Harris in that it's just an like, angry, it's I'm an angry ever, run waiting to happen. Yeah. That's what it is. It is just an angry run waiting to happen. He's downhill, just pure. I'm just going to attack the guy in front of me. Uh, and, and I think that's I think that's good for this offense. I think that's a good pairing with either a guy like Ramondre or if Ramondre is out, a guy like Pierre Strong. Absolutely. I love it. Just like the second, like you start the car, just like drop the hammer to the fifth. And yep. like, you know, eventually the clutch and the tranny are going to fall out, which is why Damon Harris gets hurt twice a year. But <laughs> damn, it's so fun to watch them just go angry run right out of the garage. 100%. All right. We got a couple questions from the Foxborough faithful here. Let's get going. It is a mailbag pod right out of the gate. Michael Jeffrey asks on Facebook, Shime, Fitzy, boys, what is the best thing for this team? Should they finish nine and eight or 10 and seven and make the playoffs? Or go seven and ten, eight and nine, and then craft forces Bill to make changes. Uh, so I would start by saying my assumption is is if you're going to finish nine and eight or ten and seven, and and it's just simply make the playoffs, you're probably going to lose in round one, which is why I would suggest I think seven and ten is better for the or eight and nine is better for this team than being nine and eight, ten and seven. I just think the better draft pick you can get, you need right now. Uh, you need to just replenish the cupboard. And I think Bill needs to be spurred into making some coaching changes uh, below him. I don't think Matt Patricia should be the play caller long term, nor do I think it should be Joe Judge. I have a feeling Nick Cayley will not be with this organization after this year, which means that you are now even just bearer in the cupboards and you need to replenish. You need to restock. You need to restart. Uh, and I think I think a losing record missing the playoffs would incite some kind of change. Patriots right now currently holding the seventh seed like they did last season, entering the postseason. They obviously have four games to go, a necessary four-game stretch to try to clear a path to the postseason. Shime, do you know who their opponent would be if the playoffs started today? Uh, yeah, they would draw the Kansas City Chiefs, and it would probably be similar to what happened last year, where you don't force them to punt, and it's like 43 to, to 13. Yeah, but oh, instead of 47 17, you went 40. Still a 30 point wild card, super wild card round defeat. Now, hold on. Belichick has been able to mute, Patri uh, mute Patricia. That's what I usually do on Monday nights when I don't want to see his name <laughs> pop up a million times on Twitter. No, but he's been able to hold Mahomes at bay has for he? usually like a half. 
<laughs> yeah, and then in that second half, he scores 30 points. Right. Remember that AFC Championship game? Like, they had, what, three points at half, and then they ended with 34 or something mm -hmm. like that? It was like, nuts. Nuts. And, and, and Mahomes right now, shockingly to everybody, loses Tyreek Hill, is playing the most efficient football he has ever played to the point where he's, he's made himself better by not relying on the speed. EPA per play, uh, he is he has like a 0 .33 EPA per play. So for those of you who don't know, there's only like 10 quarterbacks in history to have had an EPA of 0 .33 or higher in an, any given season. I think the only time he had a higher EPA was in that uh, first full season as a starter where he had 50 touchdowns, 5,000 yards, and won the MVP. But like he's close to playing as good as he was playing then. And that's without Tyreek Hill. So just like think how how ugly that could get. There's my favorite little DVA hole in action right there. <laughs> I think most saying, listeners like don't even know what EPA means. They're like, GPA? Uh, I, I, he went to Texas Tech. He can't be that smart. I am a, DVA, uh, a DVA now, hole for a reason. Uh, for a reason. EPA, for the audience listening who may not know, one of those next-gen statisticals is? Yeah, so that means expected points added. And it's uh, a person, the best analytical way to determine how efficient you are uh, at offense or defense. So... 0.33 doesn't sound high, but it's very, very high. And and, and so it, expected points, it's not like war in that. It's mm -hmm. more just the best success rate metric that you have uh, for an offense or a defense. And Patrick Mahomes is far and away the highest EPA per play uh, in the NFL right now. Copy that, Gold Leader. Uh, moving on, um, I, st I think the Patriots would be better served by actually getting their act together, winning some games and getting back to the postseason as well. I, I just I if you if you like, I just can never root against making playoffs. I can never root against bonus ball. I can never like they're going to have to grow. They're going to have to cut their teeth. You may have to keep charging up that hill, trying to knock off the bully, whoever that bully is X number of times. It's not as easy as Tom Brady, Robert Kraft, Bill Belichick, Gronk, Edelman, Welker made it look for two decades. But you can't, I, I just can't, th there's going to be change anyway this offseason, I firmly believe, whether they make the playoffs or not, and I would rather they make the playoffs. Also, it gives us several more weeks of stuff to talk about on the pod and the radio, so sure. my life will be easier, I know your life will be easier. Trust me, I love playoff football as much as the next guy, and normally I'd want the Patriots to to absolutely make the playoffs and, and try and have a run. But and how are you going to get rich betting against the Patriots without the Patriots making the playoffs? True. I would absolutely bet, <laughs> bet against them in week one. Uh, but I, so my thought, my, my theory is though, is that I just, I don't want to be, I want to get back to winning. I want to be able to compete for the AFC titles and the, and the Super Bowls and compete with the chiefs and the Bengals and the bills long-term. And to me, sitting in the middle and just barely making the playoffs every year and then getting pummeled in the first round, I feel like the Pittsburgh Steelers, where it's like, ah, Mike Tomlin hasn't had a losing record. Yeah, but when was the last time you were even like in an AFC championship game? Like 2016 it, for the Steelers. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's got their it's, doors blown off by the Pets. It, oh, and they got their doors blown off. Exactly. And so it's like, but at the same time, you're never. I mean, you lost to Baker Mayfield in the Browns a couple years ago in the playoffs. It's like, I, I don't want to be a just above 500. Yay, we stuck in the playoffs team. I want to be a competitor. And in order to do that, you have to kind of be bad for a brief period of time, unfortunately. Uh, I know, but there's you can't win a playoff game unless you make the playoffs. So True. Fair point. All right. To the Twitter machine we go. At Uncle Buck 617 Of the five players who can come off injured reserve this week, Christian Barmore, Jake Bailey, Marcus Cannon, Chasen Hines, and Brian Hoya, who would you have who would you say would have the most immediate impact? Like who do you want to see? I mean, it's got to be Barmore, right? Oh, a hundred percent it's gonna be Christian Barmore here. I, I want to see what it would look like on a third and long. Uh, especially against a Derek Carr <laughs> team where you have Barmore pushing up the middle, U Udon and uh, Judon and Uche pushing. Save from the that. Side. Save that faux pas for later. I'm also hungry, and I would love would love some Udon noodles like it's nobody's business right now. Yeah, I uh, want to see the three of them on a pass on a pass rushing down and just see what we have. Mm, just on on my mark, unleash hell. Yeah, just, just like on my mark, boys. get set, go. Yeah, and I know. Just get it. Release if I could power rank their importance in terms of returning, I would actually go. I this may not even be the most popular ranking. I would probably go Barmore, Hines, Cannon, Bailey, Hoyer. Now, the reason why I say Hines is because I want he would potentially come in as your backup center and a swing guard. 
And while Marcus Cannon okay. has more pro experience and can play guard and tackle, and we obviously need help help <clears throat> at tackle, I think his be- obviously his best days have passed. If you know Isaiah Wynn was the lowest graded right tackle in the NFL, uh, Marcus Cannon was right down there with him as well. Not as many penalties, obviously, before he had to go on injured reserve, suffering an unfortunate concussion. But uh, Chase and Hines, here's a big, strong, young guy from LSU who I think could make a difference on the interior of that line or act as a jumbo package, tight end, extra guard as well. Uh, so I would put him just above Marcus Cannon. Then I'd want to get Jake Bailey back because the Polarity party has been over pretty much the, as soon as it started. And Brian Hoyer, he's hell he's whatever he's doing, he's fine. I know. Yeah. Whatever he's doing, he's, he's I, fine. I, but I, I want would, Barmore back big time. I would probably put Cannon over Hines just because I know Cannon can run block. He's he's not he's old and not gonna be a good pass blocker, mm-hmm. but I know he still has it in the run blocking game. And this rushing attack outside of this past Monday night, uh, thanks to some juice from some rookie running backs, has been one of the worst rushing attacks over the last five weeks of the season. Uh and and as much as I love Mondre, it's not his fault. It's just the offensive line wasn't great at at, at opening lanes and they were forced to throw a lot more and he was a check down guy. He was catching a lot of passes. So Mondre was doing what they asked him to do. Um, but the rushing attack was awful uh, the five weeks prior to Monday. And so I think Marcus Cannon could at least assist in helping that. And I think adding to the run game means that the pass game might be able to succeed a little bit more. Copy that. Uh, moving on. John Langlois on the book of face says, do you guys think this team can ever play a mistake free football game this season. Like, is it possible? Patriots have what is it, 35 pre snap penalties this season? That is just unthinkable through yeah. 13 games. They're averaging two and a half pre snap penalties a game. They might have had one a season during the Brady years. Self inflicted wounds left and right. Can they do it, Sean? As long as Trent Brown is on the field? No, you cannot. No, you cannot. Simple answer. What is it up with? Like, nobody looks better. Like, he just absolutely devoured J.J. Watt on some plays. And then on other ones, looked tired, disinterested. An absolute turnstile. Absolute. I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Again, I'm so tired of saying, like, oh, it's almost like his offensive line coach isn't there to coach him up. He's not. He's busy calling plays and trying to figure out how to matriculate the ball down the field. You know what? I bet if Dante was there, Trent Brown would be having a much better season. <laughs> not even close. Yeah. I mean, I want... I put out a little something Monday night saying like my Patriots Christmas wish list, and we can do that on next week's mailbag Ooh, podcast. Nice. But my Pat's Christmas wish list began and ended with a new offensive coordinator and a new offensive line coach. And here's the rub: they can't be the same person. I like that. That's a good. They that's a good caveat. Can't, to add. Cannot disclaimer being they cannot like be the same person unless it's Dante. You know what? Dante can do whatever he wants. I love Dante. But that's he won't fine. Come out of I literally don't give a shit if he can do whatever he wants. Um. If you could pull Ernie, here's a fun one. Hypothetical. Uh, Fitzy asks, okay. if you could pull Ernie Adams or Dante Scarnecchia out of retirement for the rest of the season, who would it be? It has to be Dante. I'm not. I don't think Bill has lost a step in terms of challenging plays, managing clock. I, oh, I think you don't know the things Ernie Adams did, my man. He I, did all all the dirty work. I know, but Mr. I, uh, Wolf. I think Dante would be able to have this. He would make this offense look manageable. Like it would be okay because the offensive line would be about 10 times better. Uh, tighten and shit. He would tighten it up, tighten it up, tighten he, up a hundred percent. He would have these offensive linemen in line to, 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 to use that turn of phrase. So uh, I, I would choose Dante. It makes sense. I, I just like entertaining that one in a argumentative hypothetical because each of them is sorely missed. Skarnecki, his name gets mentioned sure. all the time. But I think people sleep on how much dirty work and how much important in-game and preparatory work Ernie Adams did. It's the little things, those intangibles that he helped. <laughs> but, you know, grease nicely, polish and button up for Belichick. I think those time. intangibles were really good because you had Tom Brady. So all of the normal... um uh, like uh, scars and cuts mm-hmm. would be covered over by Tom Brady. And then Ernie can come in and fill in all the extra stuff, fill in the cracks and really make it an airtight ship. But without that Brady bandaid, it's, I almost feel like the Ernie importance kind of decreases just because you haven't already reached a certain level for him to secure everything down. All right. Uh, at title talk TCL online. Do we have a good nickname yet for the Uche Judon duo? Now yeah, I will it has okay. to has to be the Udon noodles. The the, the Judon uh, the Udon noodles? The Udon noodles, yeah. Okay, you want to go with the Udon noodles. I offered up this on 
Twitter a little while ago. I offered up that it should be combining the two names. I offered Juche. Like that. And, okay. I did too until um, at Denora NE reminded me a couple hours ago, Juche, J-U-C-H-E, uh, is the state ideology of North Korea and the official ideology of the Workers' Party of Korea. Okay. So uh, let's pivot then. Instead of making it a ch, right, we'll just make it sound like a C. So it's if they become, rest in peace, Juice World. Juice World. But it's spelled J-U-C-H-E. How about we... the Juice Bros? Ooh, yeah. Uh, the Juice Boxes. Either one. The Juice Box. Got... Okay. Juice Pack. Yeah. Uh, the Kool-Aid Men. Like, I think <laughs> I think all of these, any kind of, I think you can make a playoff the of Juice. The Rumble. Yeah. Yes. I think you can make uh, a playoff Juice instead of Juice. Right. Um, it's Josh and ja, ja, Juice and Joe, Joe Day. Nope. Um. Yeah, you always want to go something they, like my favorite nickname, like they're, like you had the Steel Curtain in the 70s. Yep. You had the Purple People Eaters of Minnesota. My favorite, now this played off of uh, um, obviously like a business area, something well-known in New York, the Stock Exchange, when it was Joe Klecko and Mark Gastineau back in the 80s, that they were called the New York Sack Exchange, which I thought was awesome. Yep. Um, so maybe, some, maybe there's something regional. Maybe there's something... Um, you know, that's not going to be like chowder power or Boston, something like the Boston juice party, Boston juice, the boss. Yeah. The, um, uh, Oh, uh, 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 isn't, um, uh, Oh God. Uh, now I forget. Forget it. Okay. <laughs> Nailed it. There's a reason why people don't hire our think tank. We'll fix it in post. That's fine. But if any listener has any other suggestions for juche, the juice pack, the juice bros, Etc. Uh, udon noodles, uh, please by all means. And if you, by the way, if you've never had udon noodles, treat oh. yourself tonight. Whether in broth, sauteed, uh, they're the best. My absolute so favorite. Good. So good. Uh, Mark Tossi on the book of face. What's your thoughts on free agents signing here, guys? I believe free agents may not want to sign because Bill has made such a mess of this coaching staff. Do you yeah. think free agents will think will like take into consideration like, oh boy, seems like a lot of people were unhappy with Matt Patricia and think Bill Belichick's lost his fastball. I don't know if I want to go play there. I mean, is this really like, you know, goat coach season anymore or will they just take the money and don't care? Well, so I, I mean, I think you, if you're overpaying for a guy, I think they'll still come here. Um, but I don't think guys are going to take those discounts because it's, there's the allure of playing for Bill Belichick is gone and there's no Tom Brady. There's no allure of playing for Tom Brady, right? So instead you can go play for a guy like Sean McVay or a guy like Kyle Shanahan or Mike McDaniel in an offense that's far more electric and far more high powered and is going to make you look better as a player and therefore probably make you more money in the long run. And so unless you get a better off, a good young stud of an offensive coordinator in here, unless you prove to the world that your offense is fixed and you're ready to lock and load, offensive players are going to be hard to come by. I think defensive players are still want to play here. You want to go get a guy that's similar to your, you know, the, the Stefan Gilmore signing or the Matt mm -hmm. Judon signing, mm -hmm. you're going to be able to do that. Uh, you won't have to pay, you know, a uh, hand over fist for them, but on the offensive side, you might need to. Yeah. And Judon said he didn't pick the Patriots. The Patriots picked him when he got offered the four year, 50 contract. Had the, yeah. He got four for 54. Uh, I still think the man now is underpaid considering the impact Best he has had. They made. Yeah. That's the Jersey to buy now. That's, I mean, I'm always going to want to remember red sleeves. You can pair it up. Uh, it pairs perfectly with any outfit. You can go, as, it can costume it. Great for the holidays. Great for the kids. I would also get a, a Jones 25 at this point because I think Marcus Jones is going to be something special. He's awesome. For a while to come. Kid's legit, man. He's he's the real deal. Um, but yeah, as far as, you know, overpaying on defense, you may not have to as much on offense. You're probably definitely going to have to overpay to convince people like, yeah, I promise we'll get the most out of you. Yeah, but what about what happened? Like Aguilar. Look at Nelson stunting. Aguilar. Yeah what, Parker. yeah, what about John o. Smith? Like, I don't want to go down. Like, actually, John o. Smith probably has no complaints. He's like the check cashes every week, guys. So <laughs> right. it's not bad. Come Bobby on. Bobby Bonilla, baby. Uh, and finally, Jordan Watson, regular contributor to the Six Rings pod here uh, on Facebook. He wants to know, guys, how drunk will I have to get? If I play a drinking game where I have to have a uh, a shot or a drink every time on the broadcast, they mention McDaniel's and Patricia. You be ready. You are going to be toast. hammered. You yeah. are going to you are going to be hammer time. 
mix in a be... couple waters with that. Otherwise, you might be making a trip to yeah. the hospital. I would probably recommend a a big uh, multiple egg sandwiches, nachos, ribs, um, Alka Seltzer, couple kombuchas, because uh, yeah. you are going to be clean up that every, six six sheets to the wind. You, oh my god, we which one wanna... gets mentioned more? Mm. Josh McDaniels, just because he's the head coach of the other team. Yeah, and it's a Fox broadcast now. I don't even think it's like I think it's like the Fox yeah. beat. Yeah, it's, it's like the Fox B team. It's it's Kenny Albert. Uh, it's the uh, Kenny Albert squad. I forget who else. I like Kenny Albert, so I'm fine with it. He's but fine. He's have, really good have, at hockey, but yeah, he's you know he he's fine. I like the uh, I like the other guy who do, who calls who's now, who now calls the World Series in absence of Joe Buck. I forget what is his that name Kevin is. Kevin Burkhart. No, Burkhart's the A guy with Greg Olson now on Fox. Oh, I don't know who calls the World Series. Uh, Fox, bro. Yeah, I'm going to find out right now. World Series. There you go. Let's find out. There you go. Uh, and that broadcaster is... And Rosenthal. Uh, John Joe, Joe Davis. Oh, he's got... The, that. He's that that vanilla, that generic. I like Joe Davis. He calls the uh, baseball now with John Smoltz. He's got a good voice. I like when he calls football as well. And I still miss yeah. Gus. I still miss Gus Johnson. Oh God, uh, I love Gus Johnson. Yeah, he's so great. On, he's so great on the college football games. He was great. Yeah. Ohio State, Michigan was a great game to begin with, but Gus Johnson on the call, just like next level, the next level. If there's guys that can always call my games, it is Gus Johnson and Kevin Harlan. Always, I will never mm-hmm. be mad about either of those guys calling the game. I sneaky love Mike Breen still. Oh, okay, I get I that. Do. I do, and I miss Doc Emmerich. The like the oh, I miss Doc. the legend, the, the legend of hockey. He was the freaking best. All right, Shime, I'm on my way out to Vegas in just a couple of days for the game. I'll be hosting. In case anyone's listening, if any Pats fans are going to be in the area this weekend and want to come hang out with some fellow mass holes, Saturday afternoon, three thirty to five thirty Pacific time, I'll be hosting a little Pats fan rally at Rhythm and Riffs, a music venue and bar Great in spot. the Mandalay Bay Hotel. It's going to be a good time. Be tailgating and hanging out Sunday before the game, so make sure you give a follow at Fitzy GFY, and uh, we'll let you know where it's at. We'll have a little, maybe we'll get together a little tweet up and a watch party. You got World Cup soccer on Sunday. You got three Saturday football games, and Patriots Raiders Sunday four or five Eastern time. Your prediction before we let you go for the game on Sunday? Yeah, I'll take the Pats. Um, I don't know what score I want to go with. I do think they get to eight and six but I don't know how well the next three games are going to go. So I'll take the Pats. I'll say Pats by three. Pats by a field goal. Okay. Yep, Pats by a field goal. I'll take it. Listen, uh, they are currently one and a half point dogs, if I'm not mistaken. Are they really? Or are they? Well, you're the BetQL guy. I know. I I, I, I got to tell you, I've been uh, kind of away from the lines. No, they're one point favorites at the moment. Oh, the, oh, the point. It opened as uh, Raiders one and a half. It has swung since Monday night. I can tell you where the money is if you give me un momento. But yeah, I... Uh, I, I've, for whatever reason, I have been away from the lines a little bit this week. All right. Um, Take a moment to step back and refresh. Exactly. You know, kind of need that with the holidays. But uh, sure. yeah, 59% of the money right now is on the Patriots. Not so. surprised. Not surprised at all. I think Raiders have plenty of talent. There'll be difficulties aplenty containing Josh Jacobs and Devontae Adams. But uh, just uh, any team that has showed the quit or the inability to professionally wrap up games in hand, like the Raiders have four different times, blowing three. Leads of 17 points or more. Insane. And last week's unthinkable 16-3 bed shitting with five minutes to go against a quarterback who arrived less than 48 hours prior to kickoff. So dumb. pathetic. So bad. So bad. But so very good hanging with you again one time, my guy. He's Always. at Shime Time. Chris Shime on the Greg Hill Morning Show every week here on Six Rings Pod with Mailbag and more. Your old pal at Fitzy GFY, Nick Stevens, signing off saying thanks for listening to Six Rings and Football Things Mailbag Edition, a presentation of WEEI Odyssey and 2400 Sports. We'll be back tomorrow with Andy Hart and our Raiders preview episode. We'll take you behind enemy lines, talk pats, give our preview prediction and so much more. Until then, and as always, thanks for listening. Good day. God bless. And as always, go pets. See ya.